So my aim today is to try to, uh, to explain some things about Brexit in the context of health foreign policy. Um, I appreciate that this is a, a topic that is of particular salience for me because I'm a, a British citizen but someone who studies the European Union um, and that it's not necessarily of particular salience outside of the European Union. So if there are things that I say during my talk that don't make sense to you or whatever, please just wave at me and I'll try and explain or uh, uh, you know, give a bit more context. To, to, to kind of clarify things. It's the first time that I've given this talk outside of Europe, so uh, it's, it's really lovely to be able to, to share some of these thoughts with you. <coughs> okay, um, when I show this slide in, in uh, British context, everybody recognises it. Uh, this is the famous battle bus of the Leave campaign, well it's famous in England anyway. Um, and uh, we should start off by noting that this is a huge lie. Uh, it's a lie both in the claim made, in the sense that of the amount that's sent to the EU. There's a number of, number of ways you can calculate how much a country sends to the EU, but if you use any of those ways, you don't get to this figure. Um, and it's also um, a lie in the implication that that £350 million a week would come to the NHS in April of 2019 once the UK has left the EU. That's not going to happen. Uh, it's a lie that the law has been completely unable to do anything about. Uh, one possible legal way that one might think of in terms of challenging this is the use of the NHS logo. That logo is not only copyright, I'm sure we're all thinking that, but there are also some very specific regulatory rules about who can use the NHS logo within the English NHS, and who can't, and why can you, and why can't you. And when I and many other people wrote to the NHS to say, why are you allowing them to use the logo like this, none of us got a response. So the law was really not helpful there in that um, Instance, And this is one of the really interesting things about studying Brexit and health law, is that we as lawyers are accustomed to thinking about law as being a useful tool to challenge things that are wrong <coughs> and unfair. And in this instance, that wasn't always possible. It wasn't always possible to do. Anyway, so why should we focus on the legal and policy aspects of Brexit for health? Well, health matters. Health matters to the UK population, health matters to the population of other EU countries. Uh, health is to do with human dignity. It's a basic provision of solidarity. Uh, some even, even say that it's a human right. Uh, health also matters, as the bus suggests, to the EU referendum debate and its consequences. And the Leave campaign are on record as saying, would we have won without the... Uh, NHS claim? No, probably not. So this was pretty critical. So that's the first thing to say by way of introduction. The second thing to say by way of introduction is this. Isn't the EU all just about trade? What on earth has the EU got to do with health? Well, yes, the European Union is about trade. It is basically a trade agreement. But it is also much more than a simple trade agreement. It's an agreement in international law that provides an unprecedented and un unparalleled depth of economic integration, both in terms of the areas of life that it covers and in terms of the roles of law in securing that integration. The European Union is not a state, but it's far from 28 separate economies either. And over more than 40 years, the deep integration involved in the UK's membership of the European Union has touched all aspects of domestic life, health included. So European Union health law has affected, either directly or indirectly, virtually every aspect of the UK's health law and policy. It's affected staffing of the health system, recognition of professional qualifications, integrated health care on the island of Ireland, cross-border health care for travellers around the European Union, uh, retired UK nationals in the warm, sunny parts of, of Europe, like Spain, um, uh, 
matter close, I'm sure, to your hearts at the moment, uh, given that winter is still continuing here. Uh, EU law affects pharmaceuticals and medical devices, supply chains. It affects human tissue and organ safety. It affects research data. All of these aspects of domestic health law are affected by EU law. And there's specific EU law on matters relating to health, medicines regulation, clinical trials law, mutual recognition of medical professional qualifications. And there are also the many ways in which general EU law, general trade law, applies to and in health policy contexts. So uh, EU procurement law, for instance, when the government procures supplies or services, EU procurement law potentially applies <coughs> in that context. Trade law, we talked about already, movement of products across borders, um, also free movement of workers and citizens within the EU, and so on. So there's a huge amount of EU law that needs to be unpicked or reconfigured if a country leaves the EU, and that has effects in every area of life, including health. The, the picture is a picture of kind of uh, what an EU law textbook looks like. So these would be the kind of sections or chapters in a, in a textbook on European Union law and what those cover. And the purple bar is, is health law, EU health law. So it goes across all of these different types or aspects of EU law. So, the... Uh, the way that a country legally leaves the European Union is set out in the agreement between the member states of the, e, uh, of the EU, and it's set out in Article 50 of that treaty. And Article 50 provides a procedure by which a country can lawfully leave the EU. So the act of leaving the EU has a political dimension, but it also has a really important legal dimension. And the legal dimension really matters here. <coughs> Particularly important is the fact that Article 50 gives a two-year timeline from a formal notification that a country wants to leave. So the UK formally notified on the 29th of March 2017. And so unless something changes, the UK will formally leave on the 29th of March. 2019, in other words, in less than 30 days' time. So that timeline, <laughs> coupled with the domestic politics of the UK and its current constitutional arrangements, including the fact that we have a party in government that doesn't have an absolute majority without the help of another minority party, um, also, that our two main parties do not divide leave and remain, so both of our two main political parties have both leave and remainer MPs, and also it's not quite possible to say that their constituencies are leave and remain, but it's nearly possible to say that. Um, and also the relationship between our Westminster government and the governments in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, all of those things means that there is very scarce time for an orderly Brexit. The most disorderly Brexit, which is a no-deal Brexit, where the UK leaves the EU without having agreed a treaty on the basis of its leaving, which is called a withdrawal agreement, will constitute a major rupture in the certainties surrounding law and health law in the UK. And there are also uncertainties associated with a more orderly Brexit, given the need to adopt and interpret new legal texts within very tight timeframes. So you will have got the idea, that slide is deliberately murky and vague, you will have got the idea that, uh, that it matters what kind of Brexit we have. Do we have a Brexit that's based on a legally binding agreement on the terms of the UK leaving, a withdrawal agreement? Do we have a Brexit that is simply mandated by the timeline of Article 50, a no-deal Brexit? And what about the future? What is the future relationship between the UK and the EU? That matters too. So each of those things means different settlements for health law and policy will be legally possible as well as politically possible. 
And mixed political messages, confusing political permutations, both domestic and in the EU, means that it was very difficult to read the legal outcomes, hence the very indistinct picture. Now, I think I've given this lecture about 10 times since 2017 in different variations, and every time I give it, I think, right, there's going to be a bit more clarity the next time I give it, and I'll be able to actually talk about what the law will be and what this implicates. Still not. Still not clarity in terms of what the law will be, and then I can talk. So what I'm talking about is the, the basically the two different possibilities, no deal and a withdrawal agreement, and I'm talking about the future relationship. So that I have to talk about those three different contingencies because we don't have legal certainty at the moment about which it is. And you, you will be sitting there as lawyers thinking, well, that is no way to run anything. I mean, if you teach kind of even the most basic philosophy of law, law needs to be knowable. You know, that is a key inherent element of legality. And we are not in a situation where law is knowable. Mm. So that creates all sorts of problems. So here's a little bit about how we got to where we are now. This is, this is the, some of the legal steps that, uh, that took us to where we've got to. So the referendum, why is, does that say 2018? It really shouldn't. Okay, the referendum was in 2016. Um, and uh, it was advisory referendum in terms of constitutional law. That's, that's its constitutional law position. But of course, its political effect was much stronger than advisory mm -hmm. only. Um, interestingly, the group of people who were entitled to vote in June 2016 could have legitimately been constituted differently. So for instance, 16 and 17 year olds could have been included. And we know that the youth vote was largely Remain, or skewed towards Remain. 16 and 17 year olds were allowed to vote in the Scottish referendum a few years before, so they could legitimately, le legitimately have been included. Um, also, citizens of other EU countries resident in the UK could have been included, and we would guess that they would have voted for me. Um, they vote in local and European parliamentary elections, and they also voted in the Scottish independence referendum. So, you know, there were some, some things there about how the, the electorate was constituted. Again, it was not possible to challenge that using the law. Again, that, you know, that's something that as lawyers we could find quite frustrating. So, I mentioned Article 50. Article 50 gives member states the power to leave the EU in accordance with their constitutional requirements. So a state may leave the EU in accordance with its constitutional requirements. Guess what? In the UK, we didn't know what in accordance with our constitutional requirements meant. That's because we have this quite interesting, fluid constitution, which public lawyers love so much, full of conventions and you know, all, of, all of these things. Uh, so we had to have a case of our Supreme Court, there it is, telling us what in accordance with our constitutional requirements meant. And it told us that there needed to be an act of parliament uh, authorising the triggering of Article 50, and there, soon enough, that was the Act of Parliament that happened very shortly after the judgment in the Supreme Court case. And shortly after that, the Article 50 letter was indeed sent. Um, the European Union reached a formal negotiating position really quickly after that date. And kind of, um, they, they were kind of making a point about that. So the European Union, the 27 other states, were or as one, and they were able to say, this is the negotiating mandate, and the negotiating mandate legally binds the European Commission when it negotiates with the UK. And that negotiating mandate was made transparent very, very early on, so we could all see, right, these are the EU's red lines, this is what the EU legally may not go beyond. It's not just about politics, it's also about the law. Uh, the UK negotiating position was not made transparent and indeed was really difficult to work out for a very long time and probably still is, uh, really. It was difficult for us uh, in terms of observers and citizens in the UK. It was also difficult for the EU. So <clears throat> this slide is known colloquially as the steps of doom. <laughs> I'm sorry that Canada is doomed. I was going to say, where are the I know, when I was reviewing these slides this morning, I was thinking, oh my goodness, I'm going to tell a whole load of Canadians that this is the steps of doom slide. 
So, and the, you know, the reason, so, so what this does is it, the, the EU looked at what they could discern from the UK's position, and they said, right, okay, from what you say, there are all these red lines. If you want to leave the EU, you don't want to have the jurisdiction of the ECJ, uh, you don't want to have free movement of people, um, you want to have regulatory autonomy, uh, you want to have a trade policy. <coughs> well, okay, you can have a relationship like the EU has with Canada. That's the logical consequence of your negotiating position. Um, so that, again, this was put in the public domain fairly early on uh, and, and was kind of, you know, that was the EU's position. The UK kept saying, no, 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 we want to have a deep and special relationship, but it has to meet all these red lines. Um, and the, the, as far as I can understand, the UK's position <laughs> is based on being a former member state. So we are already a member state and therefore we can have a different position than a state that has never been a member state. That, that was the idea. But that isn't compatible with the EU's negotiating mandate, as the steps of doing this long shows. So negotiations carried on, and we got some bits of the withdrawal agreement in summer 2017, drafts of a withdrawal agreement. Now, when I say withdrawal agreement, it has not been formally agreed. It, it, th there's a legal text which has been signed off by the lawyers, but the pol politicians have not agreed it. That's why we're still talking about the possibility of a no deal Brexit. No deal means no withdrawal agreement. The first thing that negotiators did was the rights of human beings. So the first bits of the withdrawal agreement were all about the rights of people who have moved into the UK from other EU countries, relying on their rights in EU law, and people who've moved from the UK into other EU countries, relying on their rights in EU law. And it was all about securing the rights of those people, which is a really powerful ethical statement. And some of those people's rights engage health law and policy too, and I'll talk about that in a bit in a minute. So, by November 2018, the whole text of the draft withdrawal agreement was agreed by the EU. Um, what this does, it's 585 pages long, so it's not very long for a trade agreement, and that's because it's not a trade agreement, it's a withdrawal agreement. Um, it provides for a transitional period from the end of March 2019 until the end of December 2020. And during that transitional period, the UK's legal position is that it will no longer be a member state of the EU. So that means that the UK can, for instance, negotiate trade agreements with other countries. But EU law will continue to apply in, the, in and to the UK. So it provides for legal continuity. Um, it also has position, uh, provisions on citizens, as I mentioned. It also sets out legally how the financial settlement will be calculated. So how much will the UK pay the EU? Uh, how much does it owe, basically? Uh, that's for a whole bunch of things, including the small redistributive <laughs> things that the EU does, like its regional development funding, for instance, but also for things like um, paying for uh, civil service um, contracts and, and so on and so forth. Um, it also includes some provisions about the enforcement of the withdrawal agreement. So people who have rights under the withdrawal agreement will be able to enforce them under the withdrawal agreement. That's a little bit like EU law is. That's different from a normal trade agreement. The withdrawal agreement also has a very long protocol on Northern Ireland because the um, UK <coughs> leaving the EU will mean that there is a long <coughs> land border between the EU and the UK on the island of Ireland. It's a land border that is extremely porous at the moment. Uh, some fields cross the border. There, I can't remember how many crossings there are, but you know, hundreds of crossings. Uh, and people move around the island of Ireland as if that border didn't exist. So if you go from Belfast to Dublin on the train, you don't even know. In fact, you do know because your phone tells you, oh, you've arrived in Ireland. Don't worry, because under the data roaming law, you can still use your data in Ireland. And that's the only way that you know that, you know that you've crossed the border. There's nothing, there's no infrastructure there. And that's on the main railway between two main cities. 
never mind the kind of royal bit. So there has to be some kind of way of dealing with that border, and that's what the Northern Ireland Protocol does. Um, I, I won't go into a huge amount of detail about it because although it's really important in terms of health foreign policy on the island of Ireland, <coughs> I don't really have a lot of time to go into that just now, but we can talk about it afterwards if people are particularly interested in the Irish situation. Uh, what the protocol does is establish a single customs ter territory between the EU and the UK. And crucially, the protocol continues after the end of December 2020 until it is replaced by something else that solves the border issue. So it could be replaced by a future EU-UK trade agreement, but it has to solve the land border issue. There is also a draft political declaration on the future EU-UK relationship. And as you can expect, from the steps of doom slide, that sort of can be read as, well, we're heading to a kind of Canada-type trade agreement. But it's very, very flexible. The language is very flexible. So it could be read to take us to other types of relationships, like the relationship Norway has with the European Union, for instance. It's deliberately political language. It's not legal language at all. And it's very, very open. One thing that the political declaration does tell us, though, is this. Health was not at the table in these negotiations. Now that's really important for a number of reasons. How, how, can, we t how can we tell that health was not at the table? Well, there's a bunch of places, I mean, we, we can also tell by asking who was present, which ministers were present when, right? Which the House of Commons Health Committee did regularly. Health is not on the table. You can tell because there's a number of places where this draft political agreement lists a whole bunch of things that the two parties agree are really important, kind of motherhood and apple pie type things. And they're things like security, um, data protection, so on and so forth, uh, protecting the environment. And in none of those motherhood and apple pie places is health mentioned. It's not there. So it's not in the mind of the, the negotiators. It's not seen as a key thing to be considered. Um, and I think that's, that's also an important insight. But without a legal text, of course, you can't really do anything big a lot. So let's turn to health law and policy. The initial um, published analysis that I did uh, on this. It's done with a bunch of uh, public health and health policy people, and it's a bit small at the bottom of the slide, but their, their names are all listed there, and it's published in The Lancet in autumn of 2017. So um, you'll be aware of The Lancet, you know, it's read by most, most health professionals globally, I, I think. And what we did was, we took the World Health Organization's health system building blocks. So this is, the, uh, this is a, a chart that the World Health Organization um, uses. Uh, and we took each of these six building blocks and we thought about, right, okay, the different types of Brexit that we can imagine, so Norway, Canada, No Deal, for instance, how would each of those fare for each, or how would each of these health system building blocks fare under each of those different types of Brexit? And so what we come up with is a table that looks like this. So down the side here is all the different health system building blocks, so workforce, financing, products, service delivery, and so on. And across the top are kind of soft Brexit, so kind of Norway, hard Brexit, so not even Canada, WTO law, and no deal Brexit. So what you can see at a glance there is that no deal Brexit is significantly worse for health than other types of Brexit. But in general, Brexit's bad for health. There's, n there's nothing good. So there's virtually no green cells anywhere here. There's nothing that can be improved by leaving the EU. And depending on the type of leaving, it's not good. But we're doing this in autumn 2017, so if you remember, we didn't really have any legal texts to do this analysis on. We had to do it on what was available in, in the public domain, what political texts there were. So we did a follow-up analysis, which was published earlier this month, also in The Lancet, 
Uh, and that is modelled on the actual legal texts that we have and political texts that we have on the table. So what we have here is no deal Brexit now is, is over to the left. Uh, the withdrawal agreement is the second column. The backstop, so the Northern Ireland Protocol, is the next problem, uh, uh, sorry, column. And the last column is what we can discern from the political um, declaration. So the overall key message, again, is that a no-deal Brexit is significantly worse for health than other forms of Brexit. All forms of Brexit are bad for health, but no deal is worse. And it also shows that there are aspects of the post-Brexit future for health that would be relatively unchanged even after transition if the Northern Ireland Protocol comes into effect. Those are the ones to do with products. And um, this is the rest of the table. Um, I can't fit it all into one slide. Um, so the, the message is the same. You can see that Brexit is bad for health law and policy. So let's give some examples of the ways in which it is bad news. So here's one example. Um, this is Levy U uh, on Twitter. And uh, they're suggesting that outside of the EU, the UK could, lead, could move to lighter regulatory approaches, for instance, on professional qualifications. So those who want to leave the EU are conceptualizing these regulatory aspects of health, like professional qualifications, as red tape, as harmful. These things that they call red tape, I would call things that are there to secure patient safety or public health. I, I would not say that those are red tape. So that's one example. Whatever form of Brexit we're talking about, there's a couple of really major negatives for uh, health care and the health system. In all forms of Brexit, UK influence over <coughs> European health law and policy is, of course, diminished. And also, scrutiny and stakeholder engagement of the legal and policy changes is harder to achieve. So the UK is immediately excluded from the EU structures and institutions that determine many of its health law and uh, regulatory policies. And this happens immediately from the end of this month. So for instance, the European Medicines Agency has relied significantly on the capacities of British regulators based in its office, which used to be in London and has now relocated to Amsterdam. So the UK's influence, kind of soft networking type influence there, is significantly diminished. And there were some aspects, for instance, of the way that the EU was regulating clinical trials that weren't particularly optimal in terms of um, new medicines, novel medicines. And the UK was able to use its soft power to change the EU's regulatory approach there. Um, similarly, in terms of uh, working time rules for doctors. So that there have been places where the, UK has, the UK's membership of the EU has been good for health law and policy at an EU level, and of course that goes. There's also the negative in terms of scrutiny and stakeholder engagement, and I think this is a big one. Um, lack of scrutiny means, or of course has, has consequences in terms of legitimacy, accountability, um, democracy. It also means mistakes can be made inadvertently without being spotted. But those of us who work in the health law and policy domain are familiar with the idea that lack of scrutiny means that powerful interests, like global pharma or tobacco, for instance, powerful interests may be able to secure advantages outside of the normal spotlight of the stakeholder scrutiny and accountability. And uh, to illustrate what I mean, here's just one example. So, in order to make all the legal changes so that our law is disentangled from EU law, but that we still have functioning law, the, e, the, sorry, the UK has been adopting a huge amount of secondary legislation, statutory <laughs> instruments. So there's, a, there's an enabling power given to ministers to lay these statutory instruments before Parliament, and they are basically um, cleared by Parliament without proper scrutiny the way that 
and more than we have. There's tons of these, I mean hundreds of these, and there are scores of these that have relevance for health. So here's one, this is what they look like. Here is one on blood safety. Now, who's got time to check whether this statutory instrument simply continues everything as it is, but just does it outside of the EU? So there's no substantive change, it's just not relying on EU law, it's just relying on domestic law, or whether it makes a substantive change. So at the moment, for instance, uh, for all um, plasma users in the English NHS under the age of 25, we use plasma from Austria. Why? Because the plasma from Austria is not at all implicated in um, BSE VCJD from back in the 1980s and 90s. Um, I haven't got time, and I'm pretty sure nobody in Parliament has time, to check whether this actually changes that or not, because you, in order to check it, you have to go and look at all the things that it refers to and all the guidance that it refers to. You have to look them all up. It would cost me a day's work to check that. Um, well, half a day, maybe. And there are scores of these. So certainly the Parliament's Health and Social Care Committee does not have time to check whether changes are happening, substantive changes are happening, or whether these statutory instruments are just doing continuity. Here's another example where no deal is particularly problematic. So this is what the pharmaceutical supply chain looks like, it's kind of mock-up of it. Um, at every stage in this diagram, products or the components of products, pharmaceutical products, may cross EU-UK borders. So to get from the start to the patient, there might be multiple border crossings. Um, even just at the distribution stage, there are companies that produce um, pharmaceuticals in the UK, but they hold them in a warehouse in the Netherlands before bringing them back to the UK to be used in hospitals. So everywhere there could be a border crossing. So the English NHS, like many health systems, has been encouraged to become more and more efficient. And that means, in this context, just-in-time processes. And just-in-time processes don't work if you add any delays anywhere in the process. So even a brief delay at the border will mean that the supply chain breaks down. And even if the UK just were to open its borders and say, right, okay, we're not going to check anything coming in, just let it all come in, that's not legally possible for the EU countries. So when anything goes out into the EU to come back into the UK in the supply chain, there is going to be a delay. Why is that? Because legally, especially in the case of a no-deal Brexit, the EU has to treat that product as a product coming from a country with which the EU has no trade agreement. They're just trading on, on the basis of, of World Trade Organization. So that will mean checks. That will mean checks at the, at the, the borders. And some of the economic modeling or the supply chain modeling of this suggests that even adding a few minutes of delay to do a border check will mean massive queues of uh, lorries um, in, in the border regions, in the Netherlands, in France in particular, uh, and in Dover, around Dover, Calais, and Kent, in, in the UK. Delays disrupt these just-in-time systems. So long as the withdrawal agreement enters into force, this will be fine uh, until December 2020 because supply chains will not be disrupted immediately. But without a withdrawal agreement, this would be hugely problematic. So to give some examples of particular products, medical consumables, pharmaceuticals, currently there's no dialysis tubing at all made in the UK. We rely on the EU for all of our dialysis tubing. So that's all patients who, who need dialysis, and of course they need it regularly, are reliant on the supply chain. 7% um, of plasma products are imported from the EU. If we have a disorderly Brexit, the UK has about four or five months' worth of stock of most drugs, which isn't enough to ensure a, a continuity of supply if there were an emergency. What the government has done is ordered the industry to stockpile an extra six weeks of their drugs, and we believe that the industry has done so, but there is no transparency about where the money to pay for that has come from. And the government has... Um, given guidance to say to hospitals and medical professionals do not stockpile locally because that will make it worse 
And there's plenty of evidence that patients, individual patients, of course, the more powerful individual patients who are able to do this, are privately stockpiling medication that they need. And of course, stockpiling is not possible for some substances that have a short expiry date, like radioisotopes, for instance, or complex biologicals. It might be that some of the actions that the UK government are taking to deal with a uh, no-deal Brexit in a health policy context are in fact unlawful. So here's an amendment to the Human Medicines Regulations. Um, it, the Human the Medicines Regulations cover the relationship between prescribers, so doctors and nurse uh, practitioners who prescribe medicines for patients, and pharmacists. Um, so what I mean, there are shortages of medicine in a health system all the time, and the system normally copes with them. But a no-deal Brexit, for the reasons that I just articulated to do with supply chains, um, is expected to result in unpredictable and unprecedented shortages of many, many medicines. So there are around 7,500 medicines in regular use by the NHS that are supplied by or involving the European Union. That figure has only very recently been released in the public domain. So for a long time, Parliament and uh, other stakeholders were trying to find out whether the government had even got this information, like just the number of drugs that we're talking about. And they only very recently, the government only very recently even gave us that figure. There's been no scrutiny of the process by which they got to that figure. We are just told that it's commercially confidential, so they can release it. And, and there, you know, there is a commercial confidentiality issue, but there's also a massive public interest issue, I would argue, as, as a lawyer. So the amendment to the regulations allows the government to introduce something called a serious shortage protocol. And under that serious shortage protocol, if the government introduced them, that would allow a pharmacist to substitute, without referring back to the medical professional's pre uh, prescriber, so the pharmacist would substitute without referring back, not only the therapeutic equivalent of a drug, which might be problematic for some patients, because um, some patients don't have tolerance to therapeutic equivalents in certain circumstances, not only that, but also a different quantity of medication. So this is, it gives a huge, potentially gives a huge power to pharmacists. <coughs> that regulation was enacted after a five-day consultation a non-transparent consultation, which de facto, of course, excluded many stakeholders, loads of patient groups wanted to feed into the, part the consultation, but they, they couldn't, you know, they don't have the capacity to respond in five days. Um, also, health professionals were not able to mobilize to, to feed into the consultation. So the Good Law Project, which is a pro bono organization, has launched judicial review proceedings on the grounds that the regulation is ultra virus for breach of procedural propriety. Basically. So we'll see where that goes. When I took the screenshot, they hadn't uh, reached their crowdfunding total, but they have now, I looked this morning. So that's, that litigation is, is going ahead. Um, they're arguing that it has to be heard before the, the exit day, which is quite challenging. Uh, for, the, for the courts to do, so we'll see whether they have. I mean, it's, it's clearly political litigation too. It's not just about the legal point, it's about raising the awareness of, of this particular issue. Um, I think this is the last example from memory. Um, no, it's not, it's not quite. Um, how am I doing for time? I'm fine. Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. So here's a bigger picture example. This is the government's own modeling in terms of what happens to the domestic economy on different types of future relationships um, between the UK and the EU. So all of these are bad, um, but no deal is much worse for the economy. And you can see here that it's also geographically worse for certain parts of the country. So as a good health law and policy person, I was thinking, right, okay, how does that map to the areas of the UK that have worse health indicators? Guess what? Those areas that do worse are also the areas that have the worst uh, life expectancy, for instance. So 
it's going to be bad on that kind of population level. And what's bad about the hit to the economy for health is, you know, in, indirect. There's an indirect effect on health, on mental health, for instance, if people lose their jobs, uh, and and so on and so forth. And the the, the north of the country uh, and uh, Northern Ireland, for instance, they have worse life expectancy. They are the areas that are expected to suffer more economically under Brexit. But the most important outcome of the analysis that we've done is that it's also it's also uncertain. We just don't know what kind of Brexit. We don't therefore know what to expect for the NHS or for health post Brexit. Um, as I've said, the government has been doing some contingency planning, but it's very difficult to know exactly what they're doing. They haven't disclosed plans in detail. The plans also only seem to be about products, not so much about people. And of course, people are the most important resource that a health system has. And so, so there isn't there isn't much about that. They involve negotiations with the industry, so they're said to be commercially confidential. This is uh, John Crace in the Guardian, absolutely ripping apart the minister <laughs> who was uh, subject to scrutiny by the chair of the committee that I serve. Uh, I mean, she just looked. She's a doctor herself, and she just looked him in the eye and she said, "Minister." What are you doing about this, 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 this? And he did not have an answer. I mean, he was just completely not credible, but he just kept talking in the way that, you know, effective politicians are able to do somehow. <laughs> I've never learned how to do that, but they, they just seem to be able to, even now, you look at me, you know that that is not true, and you're just saying it. <laughs> anyway, anyway, it was great to watch on a kind of, um, participant observation, ethnography type level, and awful to watch just as a human being. So, here's what I think may, may happen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Even if legal structures change, what health professionals do, and those who provide health services do, is really um, ingrained with a professional ethic of care. And so I think health professionals are unlikely to change what they do just because the legal relationship between the UK and the EU has changed, unless something forces them to do that. What we're seeing in the run-up to a possible no-deal Brexit is the promulgation of a whole bunch of short time frame legal texts that are designed to minimise disruption on and around the day. So there's a, a, a I think it's a 20 day uh, legal agreement that is designed to keep the aeroplanes in the air, for instance. So there's a promulgation of these legal texts. Will there be any in the health sector? There may be some. So, for instance, it may be that some European Union countries will change their domestic health law to deal with the situation of British people being in that country needing healthcare and having no way, you know, no legal basis for, for them to rely on. And you know, I don't think there's a whole bunch of um, British pensioners who've retired, as I said, in countries like Spain. I do not believe that health professionals in Spanish clinics will turn away a British pensioner who was there a week before and was entitled to be treated and is technically no longer entitled to be treated. I just don't believe that that will actually happen. It will only happen if there's some kind of um, imperative on that health professional to turn the person away. And it will take a while for the countries to catch up. Um, this week, Spain has issued a decree that will treat all UK nationals in Spain as now in the event of a no-deal Brexit. So this is an example of these kind of little, there's no withdrawal agreement, but there'll be these little changes to the law to try to have some kind of continuity, particularly for human beings. The Spanish decree is conditional on the UK reciprocating. So I've had a conversation by email with one of my Spanish colleagues about whether what the UK has done would count as reciprocation. So the UK has changed its domestic law 
so that EU nationals in the UK will have to apply for a new um, residence status called settled status. And if they apply for that successfully, they'll be entitled to stay. They'll, they'll have residence rights. Will Spain count that as reciprocated under its decree? I don't know. So Joachim and I are kind of backwards and forwards on what, what do we think? What do we think about this? Right? So we, do, we just don't know. And th again, there's not enough time. There's not enough time for the legal, uh, legal analysis to happen um, so that people know what their, what their rights are, what their, their legal position is. So that's some of what we know, uh, how I think we might expect health law and EU health law um, as it applies, it doesn't apply in the UK and the EU to play out in practice. The most important feature of the Brexit landscape for health law and policy is uncertainty. There's a great deal that we just don't know. What would happen to health in any of these possible future relationships? How does health, how do patients, how do professionals, how do health consumables, pharma, substances of human origin like blood or organs, services, systems, how do they fare under different types of trade agreements? Now here it's really difficult to find clear information about the legal implications of different types of agreements and on what they mean for public health in the countries that enter into the trade agreements. So there's, there are some published empirical studies on the health effects of free trade agreements. I, so I was able to find one about NAFTA, for instance, um, which showed that the um, North American free trade agreement was strongly associated with a marked rise in high fructose corn syrup supply and therefore its likely consumption in Canada. Lower tariffs under the NAFTA led to increased imports of energy-dense products like high fructose corn syrup, which lack nutritional benefits. So empty calories, in other words. So NAFTA meant more empty calories in Canada. Lower prices encourage manufacturers to use these products in cheap processed food, with consequences for obesity and the consequent public health effects that flow from that. So that study provided evidence that even a seemingly modest change to product tariffs in a free trade agreement could substantially alter over time population-wide dietary behavior and exposure to risk factors and therefore public health problems. And that's one of the things that the UK public health community is really waking up to. There, there was awareness of um, food as a vector for pathogens very early on and there were kind of press reports about American approaches to food standards and food safety quite early on and people were worried about that fairly early on. But the more, um, the more hidden effects of free trade agreements people are slowly waking up to and I've been working with the Faculty of Public Health, um, they're trying to work with government, so this is an interesting thing too, right, if you're a stakeholder do you, how do you, what do you do? Do you oppose or do you try to work along? And so they've decided they're going to try and work along. So they're going to try and influence the types of trade agreements and what the trade agreements say about health. <laughs> so we'll see how that works out. Um, finally, how might people in the health sector attempt to future-proof against uncertainty? Well, here's one example. And I mentioned that um, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland are, are um, show how challenging Brexit is for health, health care and social services. So effectively there's one healthcare workforce on the island of Ireland. Uh, people cross the border every day to provide nursing and other healthcare services. Some medical professionals work in hospitals on both sides of the border, particularly if they're specialists. And people can easily do this because their rights are, are underpinned by EU law. <coughs> Um, they're also underpinned in the domestic law in Northern Ireland and in the Republic of Ireland, and that's known as the common travel area. So some of that will continue irrespective of EU membership. Um, there are also, there's also been sharing of services both sides of the border, so there's only one um, paediatric heart hospital for the whole of the island of Ireland, for instance, that they share that, that um, infrastructure. And so if you're trying to separate that out, this is not a good plan. And here's an example of how one um, 
group of people, the, the midwife sector, decided to try to future-proof themselves and their collaborations against mm -hmm. Brexit. So they entered into a concordat, um, a formal partnership agreement, which binds them to share, for instance, future training. So they're saying, well, irrespective of what the UK and the EU decide in terms of recognizing formally each other's qualifications, we are going to, we formally commit to continue to do our training together. Now, I don't know what the legal situation is of that concordat. It's clearly an attempt to use law to future-proof things. But if the EU and the UK depart in terms of their qualifications for midwives, how are they going to be able to honor that contract and do training together? But I think it's really interesting that they try to use a legal model to, to try to future-proof it in that way. Um, in the project that I'm doing with the Economic and Social Research Council, we're going to be interviewing people on the island of Ireland, including the midwives, and I want to ask them about what they think about the legal, um, what is the legal, you know, what is the legal meaning of this concordat, what do they think. Okay, so to wind up and recap, the legally imposed timeline associated with Article 50 of the Treaty on European Union, coupled with the domestic politics of the UK means that there is scarce time for an orderly Brexit. The most disorderly Brexit, a no-deal Brexit without even a withdrawal agreement, will constitute a major rupture in the certainty surrounding health law and policy in the UK. Even a more orderly Brexit involves uncertainties given the need to adopt and improve, uh, sorry, adopt and interpret new legal texts within a very tight time. <coughs> the law matters. The ways that we've conceptualized EU law and EU health law are likely to be changing as the UK leaves the system of EU law to a looser co collection of agreements with the EU on a range of different topics. And all of this will take time. One more slide to share with you. Yeah. <laughs> some of my favorite Brexit slides. <laughs> and these are my, some of my sources. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you. for questions. Anyone want to start us off? So I'm not a lawyer, I'm sorry, I'm an economist. Um, an economist. So I really, when I came here thinking about what you might be talking about, I was really sort of imagining that there'd be a lot of discussion about sort of similar to what you're talking about stockpiling. So individuals are responding to this uncertainty by stockpiling things, but in terms of human resources in the medical world, I, I just imagine, like, do you know of anything about how medical residents are changing their, where they're choosing to work? Is there an outflow of people sort of not, like at early stages of the career, not wanting to settle in the UK or outside of the UK? And yes, I, thank you. I, I didn't include that in my talk, but there is, there is some data on that. Uh, what, what we know at the moment is um, differentiated in a number of different ways. So it's differentiated in terms of professional, mm -hmm. it's differentiated in terms of career stage, which you alluded to, and it's also geographically differentiated. Mm -hmm. So if you go across the whole of the UK, it's something like 10% of medical professionals have a qualification from an EU country. So that's not big, but it's a lot of people, it's a lot of human beings. Mm -hmm. yeah. In some specific geographical areas, like for instance the Highlands of Scotland, that percentage would be much, much higher. So I heard informally that there is a <coughs> hospital somewhere in, in the northwest of Scotland where 11 of the 12 consultants are EU nationals. Right? So that 10% hides some big disparities. Mm -hmm. right? big ones. The main evidence suggests that people are waiting to see what happens. So there hasn't been a massive outflow. There has been a reduction of inflow, particularly in nursing, for instance. But there might be other explanations for that. So the, the ways that nursing training was, is financed in the UK changed at the same time. So it might, it, you know, you can't do an experiment, this is the problem with social sciences, right? You can't do an experiment to isolate the different elements, right? But the, the main evidence shows people are going to wait and see. Yeah. 
in the longer term, it's really clear that the UK will become a much less appealing place to make your medical career. And that will also be the case in um, clinical research as well, because of course there's a big overlap between science and research and treatment and care. You know, we have big London hospitals that do both things. Unless, and this is where the uncertainty comes in, unless the UK negotiates a relationship with the EU that allows those benefits to continue. So, you know, it would be possible for the UK to not be a member of the EU, but to be part of its research collaborations, for instance. Countries like Israel are. So we just don't, we don't know. And the, the, the we don't know is, I think, also feeding into people waiting to see. But thank you for giving me an opportunity to, to talk about that, because there, there is some, some data about that which didn't make it into the slides. ask you about the human element to all of this. Um, I was surprised at the beginning that when you said the laws, there hadn't been laws. Was, was it the absence of laws that meant that the leave takers' lives were not uh, brought you know, to trial, one could argue? Or was it simply that people made a political decision not to proceed? Because one of the things that you, we've had referenda in our country as well, which uh, um, I think are a useless tool, actually, for determining decisions. But, um, and one of the problems is always the rift that it leaves among people internal to the country. And I was, just happened to be there about two weeks ago, and I was stunned at the number of cab drivers and all the people uh, in, in London who were uh, quite, uh, had a visceral feeling for leaving and um, then on the other hand those who had a visceral, and so the division in the country, the human element, how will that impact the ability of law to really even uh, play a role and what happens when the Spaniards need that uh, care for their own people these divisions are very human-based. I mean, law is a wonderful tool, but A, it has to be used, and B, it has to be used in the context of what people will allow it to be used for in many ways. <laughs> and being there on site, how do you, I mean, it, yours is, to me, anyway, the most important issue, the issue of health, and health research and clinical care. Mm -hmm. uh, the others will, will all have other ways of being resolved. I just wondered if you could speak to that in terms of your own experience with the committee, whether there, whether there can be reconciliation, if you will, among the, the, the country itself. Okay, that's a small question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll try. So, I mean, I need to be careful because, of course, I also have an affect-based response to this personally. And my response is, is based on my positionality. So I'm, I'm in the north of England. I have done quite a lot of work in London. You know, you were talking about people in London, cab drivers in London being viscerally received. London is a remain city, you know. So, whereas I live in a leave city. So one of the things that was extremely difficult for me to process was realizing how many of my own students must have voted leave by the law of averages. You know? And that, that was really sobering. And it, it's very, very important for universities to be places and spaces where you can have these conversations without becoming polarized and opposition. That's one of the things that I feel passionately about higher education generally. And that's a massive challenge. Can the country be reconciled? I, I would probably change that question a little bit and say the country, we, all of everything that led to the referendum vote was there already, hidden in plain sight. It just, the referendum vote meant that people like me, who are powerful, had to see it. Right? So it didn't actually, ch in a way, it didn't actually change anything. Those divisions were there. It, it gives a very horrible uh, binary set of labeling, which is what you're, you're talking about. And I think the task of reconciling that will be a task for, for the next generation. I, I can't see it being reconciled in this generation. I just, I just don't, I don't see, it's too, as you experienced, it's too visceral. Is it too early to pick up that? 
Okay, just another uh, 10 minutes. Okay, that's good. Then. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. I'm struck at, at your graphs of who's going to suffer under this, both health-wise as well as economically. And it doesn't look like those divisions are going to be uh, moving in a direction that would heal them. No, I, th I would agree, I would agree yeah. with that. Mm -hmm. And I, I also think it's really difficult. I mean, there's, there's a really important work for social scientists to do here, including law, and I'm including lawyers in that um, group of people, to, in terms of understanding what it is that is driving the anger behind the leave vote. And you, you, you know, you described it, it is, it is visceral. It's, it's, it's felt and it's felt as anger, mainly. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's to do with, it's partly to do with legitimacy or lack of legitimacy, perceived lack of legitimacy. And of course, the NHS and health has become a sort of totemic thing for that. You know, a legitimate government is one that protects our NHS and, you know, keeps it safe from those mm -hmm. Americans. So that is one thing that might actually help to bring people together, because everybody could agree with that. And, I mean, it, what people don't understand is, is how being part of the EU actually helps the NHS. And these were not just uneducated people, these were educated people. I spent a huge amount of time on social media in the run-up to the referendum explaining to people that no, being in the EU did not mean that we were going to have to sign away our NHS to the Americans under TTIP. Because all of those things got modelled up in people's heads. And I mean educated people. You know, I don't, I, it, there just was a lot of mis, and there's still a fair amount of mis, mis hmm. Karen? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Uh, you mentioned regulatory challenges, and this is more of a quick technical question, but I wonder where, if at all, telemedicine fits into all of this. So telemedicine meaning what? Because telemedicine means a load of different things. <coughs> it, do you mean services? Yes, services. Right, okay. So EU law regulates telemedicine. Um, that's a service that crosses borders. There hasn't been much emphasis on telemedicine in the Brexit debate, so I'm guessing... Would it be impacted? Well, I, only if we rely on EU countries for telemedicine. So I know, for instance, in some of the Nordic countries, for instance, they would share um, x-rays and they would get a radiographer across the border to look at them. Right. But I don't think the UK does that. Maybe we do. And, and in terms of licensing, because we in Canada have issues with provincial versus it being the provincial jurisdiction, so that's mm -hmm. going down the whole thing. Um, I don't know if it's akin to that at all. Um, licensing of what? The uh, of, the, oh, of the physicians. Yes, that will. Because at the moment, our qualifications are all recognised by the EU, and we have to recognise the EU qualifications. So that will be continued in the short term under the withdrawal agreement. It will cease immediately under a no-deal Brexit. So licensing of the medical professionals <coughs> is absolutely engaged. Th those kinds of regulatory things are absolutely engaged. Yeah. Thanks. Just want to kind of um, ask a quick question about the settled status that you mentioned at the end of your talk um, for the, the EU residents in the UK. Is there so I, I'm assuming you know um, that would entitle them to to access to healthcare um, through NHS and so on. Um, is there any kind of mechanism put in place to actually screening people's status or to change if they're actually settled um, enjoy that status or is it more of kind of you know it's it's more of a relaxed requirement and if so may not may that have some kind of impact in terms of what you're saying um, whether there's some kind of reciprocity between Spain and UK. So I'm just trying to to kind of get a sense of how how strict is it in terms of enforcing that settled status and the entitlement to various things? Uh, thank you for your question. There has been quite a lot of discussion about this. So access to the English NHS is based on ordinary residence. It's not based on your citizenship status. And whereas most other countries use citizenship as a, as a, a way to decide who, who has access. So that creates a certain problem in terms of can, can, can you is there a reciprocity then, one way or the other? And then the other thing that's happened, so this is another example of, you know, different things are happening and some of them are to do with Brexit and some of them are not and they interact with each other, 
is that the, the English NHS did a pilot study to ask some of its hospitals to check whether people who were using hospital services were actually entitled. Uh, the pilot suggests that it's not worth putting the administrative effort in because you don't save enough right. money for what the administration costs. But that was an inconvenient outcome politically for the government. So that was quite buried. We, we had to do an FOI claim to find that information. Um, you see, law is good for some things, yeah. right? Yeah. It's yeah. yeah. very useful. It's Transparency. It's very useful. Yeah. You know? um, so, but there was there there have been some horrible individual stories. So there was a story about an uh, an Italian woman who um, presented for some kind of maternity care in a hospital, and she was um, treated with extreme disrespect by the hospital administration. They wouldn't believe that she was entitled. They, I, I think she was black, right? Or you know, that, I, I'm not sure. I haven't seen a picture of her. But they would, so there are some individual stories of administrative problems, but the general approach in England is to assume that people who present are resident or ordinarily resident. And that's part of the political dynamic that's complicated here, because then you get a narrative that's believable that people are, you know, um, walking in off the streets, taking advantage, coming over from Nigeria and using our services, right? Yeah. So, that, so that narrative is going on, and I'm guessing that you may have similar things, you know, it's a familiar uh, thing. As soon as you look at it on an economic level, you're like, well, this is completely irrational, but people are irrational. You know, people, mm. don't, sorry, we have an economist with us. People are irrational. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have time for one last question. Okay, so I will ask perhaps the elephant in the room. So what do you think is going to happen? Yeah. Oh, I love it. <laughs> that question. You're on the ground. What do you think is going to happen? I think, I'm on film, aren't I? I, I think that <laughs> Theresa May is going to get her withdrawal agreement through Parliament. Do you? That's what I think is going to happen. But if you ask me tomorrow, I might decide something else. So for months and months and months and months, it's been, in my mind, basically one third withdrawal agreement, one third no deal, one third, some miracle allows us to remain in the EU. <laughs> and and that, it, I, that hasn't changed much for months and months and months. But today I'm, I'm being optimistic and I am thinking optimistic in that regard. I, I, don't, I don't think the UK is going to remain in the EU. I mean, there is some possible political set of events that would get us there, but it's quite difficult to imagine. Uh, but I, I'm hoping that we have a withdrawal agreement. Why am I hoping that? Because it's much less chaotic. Mm -hmm. And less chaotic is better for people, and it's better for vulnerable people. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you. you so much.